Perfect. Very annoying thing right on my screen. I don't know. It says four people have entered your waiting room. It seems to be right in the middle of my screen. Is there anything I can do with this? Ah, oh, never mind. Can you minimize it with the yellow the yellow button there? It's gone now. I don't know whoever did whatever they did, but it's gone. Thank you. All right. So okay. Good evening, wherever you are, and uh, thank you for tuning into this Zoom broadcast. This lecture is entitled An Approach to Upper Blepharoplasty. And just to say that uh, and my screen is not moving, sorry. Okay, it's moving now. Okay, so this really is an approach, not the approach, because I know a lot of you will do and already do upper blepharoplasty very well and very successfully. So this is really just um, to show you a personal approach and technique. It's not one that says this is how you should do it. Okay. So I gave a lecture earlier in the series uh, on lower blepharoplasty where I focus really on the execution, a step-by-step -step approach to the surgery itself. Because lower blepharoplasty as I say, is relatively simple in assessment, but complex in the execution. Now, upper blepharoplasty is slightly different. So here I'm going to really focus on the assessment and explanation of what I do, because it's the assessment that's so complex in upper blepharoplasty. So what are, the, uh, uh, what are we looking for? So these are the four points that I will go through in the lecture. The first is objective. So what is the objective of upper eyelid blepharoplasty? And here they are, the four points, and I shall go one, each one in turn. Well, the number one thing that patients want is they want a space between their eyelash and the fold, so-called the pretarsal platform or the lid show. This is what disappears, as you see on the left picture, that they wish to establish. Now, most times we would like to establish roughly a three to four, five millimeter clear zone in this area in the occidental patients, slightly different than the oriental patients. We want to be sure that we retain volume. We do not want volume depletion, especially in the central and the lateral subbrow units. Now, the other thing is that we want to ensure that after our blepharoplasty, we have a symmetrical and a large enough eye opening. Sorry, I'm just going to move this little thing that keeps coming in the way. Okay. And finally, what we'd like to achieve is relative symmetry in the two sides. If they're asymmetrical, can we make it more symmetrical? If they were symmetrical, an enhanced symmetry as such. So, so if you look at this pre and post op uh, photos, you will see have I achieved the objectives? Now, have I achieved the pre tarsal platform? And I think she has about a three millimeter smooth pre tarsal platform. So that one's a tick. Have I retained the volume? Yes, I have. What about the eye opening? Well, you can see that the microtosis that she has has been corrected. So eye is slightly larger in opening. And it looks sort of aesthetically balanced and symmetrical on both sides. Now, as I said, the focus really has to be on the assessment before you embark on the surgery and this is how I approach uh, assessment in the upper eyelid. I really think of the area in zones, the central, the medial and the lateral. So in the central what I'm looking for is the skin crease. I'm looking to see how much skin there is but I'm also looking to see how much skin I can remove safely. Then I'm looking to see what the volume is like in this area. And do I need to do anything to adjust the volume? And finally, I'm looking at, at the MRD1, and that's principally the position of the lid height in relation to the pupil. In the medial zone, I'm looking for, is there skin that I need to sort out? And do I need to address any volume changes here, either depletion or too much. In the lateral area, what I'm thinking of is, is there skin excess? Do I need to taper that skin resection out further laterally? Is there an element of brow ptosis? 
and is there any swelling due to probable lack more gland prolapse? So those are the three areas. I'm thinking the central area, as I've said, the four points, the medial area, and then the lateral area. So every time you have a patient, don't just focus in one area, just sort of train yourself to say, I'm going to look centrally, and then I'm going to look medially, and then I'm going to look laterally. So I'm going to explain what I, why I go through that process. So in the central zone, the first thing I look for is the skin crease, because I will almost always use the skin crease as the inferior incision point. Now, again, in the occidental patients, it can range anywhere from five to 12 millimeters, and you need really a skin crease between six and 10 millimeters to get a lid show. So mark out the skin crease. Uh, I, actually, I do that in outpatient setting, but especially on the day of the surgery, just point to yourself, where is the skin crease? Now, if the skin creases are more or less the same within two or three millimeters, I will stick to the skin crease. Say one is six, one is eight. I'll probably stick to those skin creases and not change them. Now here, for example, is a patient in whom the skin crease differed by about two to three millimeters. I chose to stick to the skin crease, although it's different because it gives a better fold. It gives a more natural look. It heals quicker. So with this different skin crease, what we're worried is, will we then get a different eyelid show, a different volume in that area? Well, clearly this, these two eyelids look more or less symmetrical post blepharoplasty. Now there are certain tricks that you can do with the volume that I will show you later if you have different creases or if you, heaven forbid, but if you accidentally put the crease too high, what can you do to change the, the volumes and the lid show? There are some instances where we will deliberately change the crease. For example, if you have a ptosis and you see this totic patient has a high crease, we will deliberately mark a crease low. So from a 14 millimeter, we might put it down to six to eight millimeters. And why do we do that? We do that because we want to shorten the pre-tarsal platform or the lid show. Because a large lid show makes the patient look more sleepy. So in some instances where we cannot raise an eyelid, for example, uh, for exposure keratopathy or in some myasthenic uh, uh, patients, but we want to give less of an illusion of a droopy eyelid, you can simply change the lid show and it would look less totic. So ptosis can be made less so by simply changing the pretarsal platform. And occasionally we would deliberately wish to raise the lid show as we do in oriental patients. And then we will put the crease at a higher position. And that also has an impact on both the volume, but also on the crease and therefore the pretarsal platform. The next thing that I would look for, and most of us are concerned as patients attributes the hooding to, is skin excess. Now, if you're going to take skin away, you need a robust and safe way of marking. And just before we started, uh, I was telling uh, uh, member that I have a, a good video, which I haven't given to the, uh, the organizers, but I will uh, endeavor to send to you um, about how I mark a patient. So that's a useful video. But if you're going to mark a patient, there are two types of markings that I usually say to the fellows. There's what I call the aesthetic marking, which is temporary. And there's the functional marking, which is permanent or surgical. So my, my technique is that I usually bring the patient down to the operating suite and either within the operating suite or in the anesthetic room, if you're going to give a general anesthesia or for other surgeries, I sit them up because the room is very well lit in that area. And then I will put temporary marks for the aesthetic marking. So usually, as we've said, use the crease as your inferior incision point. The medial end, somewhere near the punctus, slightly beyond, maybe heading towards uh, the medial camphor angle, but not beyond. Where you shouldn't be in, in this area is where the eyelid curls into the nose. 
if you extend a crease and an incision into an area that is uh, con concave, when you come to stitch and later on when it scars, it will bowstring. So make sure that your mark doesn't extend to that concavity near the medial canthus. And the lateral canthus, well, it really depends how much skin you have. If you have excessive skin beyond the lateral canthal angle, you will need to really taper it up and use the best crow's feet that you can. So the lower eyelid inferior incision point goes to the crow's feet and take the crow's feet that goes upwards. Never use a crow's feet that goes downwards because it looks more, it looks sad, it looks drawn down. Then we pinch, non-tooth forceps and pinch. Now one other trick, most patients with hooding will have a inherent hidden compensatory uh, brow elevation because they want to lift the skin off their eyelid. So one thing you should do is ask the patient before you do the pinch to really close their eyes tight and then you will eliminate that hidden compensatory brow elevation and then ask them to relax very slowly and then do your pinch. That way you will take out what is necessary because if you have a, a hidden compensatory brow elevation, you will not take as much as you should. And place dots in the superior border because you know you're gonna cut in the inferior border. You can put as many uh, or a bold line in the inferior bit and even in the crow's feet, but in the top, just put some dots because the patient is sitting up. This is an aesthetic marking. Then we go on to the functional marking. The functional marking should be done with the patient lying flat because then you've eliminated the, uh, compensa the, the reverse, a brow droop, because if you take as much skin as you can with the brow droop sitting up and the patient goes to sleep and the brow goes up by five millimeters, you've taken five millimeters too much skin. So with the patient lying flat, you should then make another pinch and now to look for a lash turn. So when you pinch, just see the lash turning up. But some people say, I usually try to make sure that the patient has one or two millimeters lag of thalamus. I think that's a little bit dangerous and I'm too much of a coward. So usually I will do a pinch lying down. Again, if the patient's awake, you can do a, you know, close your eyebrows tightly and relax and then do a pinch. And that will give you a safe amount to resect. There is the surgical mark, which is you see about two millimeters below the aesthetic marking because the brow is now sitting back a bit. Now, to this day, I will always put down in my surgical notes the amount of skin that I am reviewing, but also the amount of skin that I'm leaving behind, and also the distance from the lash to the crease, because I think that helps me afterwards if I see that something hasn't gone quite right. Now, just talking about skin, one of the questions I'm asked is, is it possible to do a skin-only blepharoplasty? The answer is yes. I, I will undertake some skin-only blepharoplasty where you just take the skin that you've pinched, but really you can only do this if you're taking a small amount of skin away because the, if you take only skin away and you leave a large bunch of uh, abicularis behind, it impacts on the volume. And I'll show you what I mean later on. But it is possible to do, as I've done on this lady, who had a unilateral fold, she's a model, and she wasn't uh, you know, symmetrical in her close-up photographs, so I did a skin-only blepharoplasty to deliver a sim symmetrical tarsal show to the other side. And I'll show you another skin-only blepharoplasty, which I often call qualitative blepharoplasty. And I would say that these are blepharoplasties that, uh, unless you're confident, don't take them on, because you're not really changing the tarsal show, you're just enhancing the quality. Now this patient again is one who's on the big screen and uh, she wants to look the best because the makeup artist says that these folds cannot be hidden with makeup. So I've done what I call a qualitative blepharoplasty which enhances the periorbital appearance, but I'm not really changing the lid show. The next thing is volume adjustment. When I'm looking at the central zone, I'm thinking, do I need to adjust the volume? The number one contributor to volume is the avicularis. Now, 
I know there are many people who say you should not take out any apicularis, and you should only do a skin-only blepharoplasty. But for me, there are certain advantages to taking out the apicularis when required. Number one, it contributes to volume. So I will take out, if required, up to half the superior apicularis. Now here's a patient talking about volume in apicularis. What, is, what do I mean? Well, I've done a large skin-only blepharoplasty on this elderly patient. I've then brought the, 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 the resection line superiorly to the inferior bit. And you will see there's clearly a mismatch in the volume because the abicularis has not been resected. So the abicularis is more protuberant and adding to volume. And of course, if you want volume, it's a great tool to have. But if you have too much volume, it still looks puffy and hooded. So if you remove the abicularis, and in this case, I removed half the superior abicularis, here's the transition. It's a smoother transition and it's not so bulky. As I say, so the abicularis can be used to adjust the volume, whether to retain the abicularis, to, to retain volume, or to deplete it. So here's a patient who has puffy, bulgy looking eyes with a low brow. She has no wish to have a brow left. Can you deliver a lid show in this situation? Well, you can with certain tricks, but one of them is to re reduce the volume. And the volume here is reduced with resection of the superior half of the abicularis without any fat resection. If you remove a lot of uh, abicularis, one of the things you will do is to enlarge the pretarsal or lid show. So if you have a low brow, this is one of the tricks that you can use without changing the brow position and gives the illusion of a larger lid in the presence of a low brow. So abicularis can be manipulated to give the appearance of a large pretarsal platform. When you resect uh, the abicularis, the next thing you come to is the septum. And also, I use this to access the septum, because the septum is a useful tool in blepharoplasty. Of course, it's devised the poster from the anterior com uh, compartments. Now, in some occasions, if you have a very bulgy septum like you saw before, and you don't wish to transect the septum and go into the posterior compartment, because once you do that, you change volumes considerably. You can do septal thermoplasty to fibrose the septum to retroplace both the fat and in some cases the lacrimal gland. So this is a useful tool and this is a useful platform for that. The septum is also really useful once you've accessed it by cutting the orbicularis in placing high sutures on to the septum. And that this gives a high crease. Now, what do I mean by that? Maybe it's not so clear. So here, and I need to thank my friend and my colleague, Santiago, for drawing this out for me. So here's a cross-section of a dermatocalasis, and the patient wishes a blepharoplasty. And so you resect, remove this chunk of skin, and then you stitch it together. And what will happen is that it will fold inwards a little bit, and you will have a slight overhang. This is inevitable. So then you have a predetermined pretarsal platform and this appearance. Now, what will happen if you place, in this case, a deep vicral 6050 from the abicularis high up to the septum and tighten this? So when you tighten it, you get two effects. One, the crease will go higher. And the second effect, is that it pulls the pretarsal platform wrinkly skin up so you get a smoother pretarsal platform on lid show. So it has an impact both on the crease and also the pretarsal platform quality. So that's the difference on the two. And secondarily, because you've pulled up the crease, you will deliver a larger lid show. And that is the technique that I used for the patients with low brow. 
So here you can see, when you look at it straight on, it looks that the sutures are relatively at about, say, eight millimeters. But if you pull the brow up, actually the crease has gone all the way up maybe to 12 millimeters or so. And that gives you the ability to deliver a lid show, remember that's one of the objectives, in the presence of a low brow. So if you cut the septum, the next structure, of course, is the fat pad. And the main contributor to the fat pad in your blepharoplasty is volume. If you manipulate fat, you can adjust the volume in this area. So here's a patient that, that turns up says, I see that I have asymmetry of my eyelids and I can see that I have a, kind of a hollowness in my left upper eyelid. And I went along and I was told that I could have this filled, but I just wanted a second opinion. So I say to the patient, well, you are hollow on the left, and this is because your brow is a little bit high, and this is because you have a microtosis. So I often see, even in august publications, filling of this kind of patient with uh, non-autologous compounds, and they show great results in terms of volume replacement. And of course, they'll probably Botox the patient also to bring the brow down. But really, the correction here is a microtosis correction. But at the time of your tosis correction, you can also advance the fat pad forward. So this patient has had a blepharoplasty, but on the left side, she's also, I've also advanced the fat forward to give her a degree of symmetry. So here's the volume in advancement. And I've shown you this patient before. So this patient has a huge volume deficit. So she has a fat pad advance with her tosis correction, which greatly changes the pretarsal platform in the reverse direction. Because sometimes you want to raise the pretarsal platform and sometimes you want to lower it. Now I'd say this is an acceptable result, but because I've changed the crease to bring the tarsal platform down, I've actually, not done a great job because this really should, this incision should have been higher up but fortunately this crease will disappear with time on the other hand if you remove fat you will of course decrease the volume and this is the technique that we use in oriental blepharoplasty because we want to both devolume this area but also raise the crease and taking volume away raises the crease as the reverse is true the fourth thing I'm looking for when I'm looking at the central zone is the eye opening. Now, I've shown this to you before. So this patient has a slightly small eye. And I often am told that I went along somewhere and they told me that if I have a blepharoplasty, my eye will look more open. A blepharoplasty does not correct atosis. No matter how much tissue you take away, or fat, or bicularis, it will not correct atosis. Moreover, if you do a blepharoplasty and you increase the lid show, but keep a low lid, it will look more totic. Because remember I showed you that picture of decreasing the lid show to enhance the ptosis look. So a ptosis needs a correction with a ptosis. So sorry, I'm just going to show what MRD1 is because I use that term, but I haven't explained, but it's the distance between the pupil and the lid in the central position. Now, the other question we're often asked is, I'm sorry for those who don't do ptosis, in, in, in the context of a blepharoplasty, should you do an anterior or a posterior approach? Well, the posterior approach alters the volume very little and alters the tarsal or pretarsal platform or literature very little. So if you want a technique that does very little of that uh, with your blepharoplasty, you can use a posterior approach. However, an anterior approach, because you've accessed the fat completely, is very useful, as I showed you in this patient, to alter the dynamics. So you use the posterior for less volume adjustment and tarsal adjustment, and an anterior for more. And similarly, but in a reverse way, when the MRD1 is great, greater than it should be. So in this situation, we have a enlarge MRD1 with upper lid retraction as in thyroid disease, then the posterior approach enlarges the pretarsal platform and reduces the volume. Whereas an anterior approach lets you control the volume more because you can either 
resect or displace or advance and also really optimize your pretarsal platform. So in the context of a blepharoplasty, when you have a patient with retracted eyelids, if you want to manipulate the volume in the uh, lid show, I find it easiest to actually lower it through an anterior approach because the posterior approach is a little bit unpredictable with the lid show and the volume. So here's a patient who's had a left upper lid blepharoplasty, lid lowering, skin, muscle, and a small amount of fat resected. Now, I show you this because this patient's also had uh, upper lid retra uh, retraction reversal in the, with a the lateral horn and also correction with a camouflage temporal tarsorophy to raise the upper, lower lid up. Now, I show you this because to remind me that I have sent five videos of the upper third, which includes a technique of uh, lowering the lid, blepharoplasties, uh, and, and other things. So it, you may be of interest and you can get it from the, uh, the website. So moving on to the medial zone. The medial zone is about skin excess and volume manipulation. So if you have skin excess, and usually this occurs in uh, more elderly patients, uh, you need to make an assessment as to whether you should remove it. Not all skin in the medial third should be removed because this is the area, if you take out too much skin, that will result in lag of thalamus. The lateral third skin excess will always be compensated by a further brow droop. So you, it's very rare to get lag of thalamus from too much skin removal in the lateral third. Lag of thalamus usually occurs from skin excess removal from the medial third. So if you need to take skin away and be sure you want to do this, and usually, fortunately, it's in elderly patients, you have to make a slight adjustment to your excision technique. The thing to do is to draw a line from the medial cut end to the center of the glabella. So here's a line that I've drawn. So then what you do next is that you cut along that line then you grab, having undermined the skin from the tissue, fabricularis underneath, grab that point and move it inframedially. Then whatever, wherever it transects the lowest point of your incision, you draw a line and you resect that bit. What you're doing is you're resecting in a horizontal and you're advancing horizontally. So then you move the tissues horizontally and suture horizontally. That means that allows you to take skin away from this area safely without vertical suturing, which may result in lag of thalamus. So again, to take you through, I hope this is clear. Uh, if there isn't, I can explain it again towards the end. So what will you do if you need to take skin away from this area, such as xanthometer? Clearly you can't do a vertical excision. You could resect and do a kind of a, a sliding flap, but really, if you do a pinch technique and you determine that you can take away the total xanthometer, then you simply leave behind that amount of skin in your blepharoplasty. So you'll see that I have taken no skin below the xanthometer. Then that allows me to ensure that when I close this, uh, there will be no uh, uh, lag of thalamus in the area. So here's a patient that has had the xanthometer excised from the inferior and uh, superior eyelids. Now, what it will do, for those of you who can look very carefully, is that if you make an incision that high up for the xanthometer, you will raise the lid show in the medial third. And you will see that the lid show in the medial third, especially in the left eye, is slightly higher because that xanthometer is larger than on the other side and also slightly higher than the central portion and the lateral portion. So if you want to be very fussy, this is something that will occur. And if you have a very fussy patient, you must warn them that ideally you would like a smaller lid show in this area and a larger one lateral third, but this will not happen. Now, the other thing is, do I need to manipulate the volume in the middle third? And is there fat that I need to resect? Now, this looks bulgy. Now, before you think you will need to take fat away from this area, there's one thing you should do ask the patient to raise their brow. 
if they raise their brow and there is no evidence of a translucent look to a fat bulge in this area, it's purely skin, and this is a consequence of mild skin excess exacerbated by a slightly low medial brow. You do not need to take the medial fat pad away. If, however, it's an obvious fat bulge, as in this elderly patient, then really, I would say it's much, much easier to excise this fat than to get really complicated and try to manipulate and mobilize and suture it to the, the medial uh, horn of the, the preapinary fat pad. Yes, you can do those, and you do that for hollow patients with an A deformity of the upper lid. But really, if you just have a little bit of bulge, I'm a simple person, and I think the simplest thing, rather than mobilization and repositioning, is to excise a little bit of this fat through a small hole in the septum. And I think you'll get a very adequate result. And as long as you inform the patients your intention and you show them pictures if you have them, uh, then it, it, it'll be obvious. What about the lateral area? Well, the lateral area, there are three components, skin excess, brow, and lacrimal gland prolapse. So, now when you're doing your pinch and you realize that you have to take the skin, say to this point, which I've uh, highlighted, you cannot close this point to this point directly. Because if you do, and you taper the skin down quickly, not to go into the crow's feet, you will get a little bit of a buckle and you'll get a bit of a dog ear. So you will need to extend into the crow's feet and preferably one that fits into your line, but also deviates superiorly laterally. So that crease I've chosen. So as I say, the only other option is not to go as far as that high point and taper it down earlier before you get to the crow's feet. Now, the advantage of this is that you will not have a scar which is visible in the crow's feet. If you take it into the crow's feet, of course, that scar is present. And because it's beyond the fold of your uh, brow, it will be obvious for a period of time. But it fades away if you put it in the crow's feet. But you need to warn the patient. So your option is to taper it down quickly, but you will have a degree of hooding. Or excise it, but if you're going to excise it, you will need to extend that inferior mark into the crow's feet. And then you'll need to taper through the dot that you made as far as the crow's feet. So now you've taken an additional amount of skin in this area. And this skin will of course contribute to your blepharoplasty effect. And what it will do is it will raise your lid show slightly in that area especially if you use, as I showed you, a deep abicularis, high septum abicularis suture. So if you have a degree of brow ptosis and a, a degree of hooding in this area, a combination of skin resection and a abic septum, a big suture will give you a better lid show. So here, patients with low brows and hooding going all the way to the lower eyelid, you can deliver a larger lid show in this area. Again, a patient with hooding going extending laterally. I pulled the, I've asked her to raise the brow a little bit to show you that her crease is much higher laterally, which is difficult without that extension. And here again is a patient who has ex huge amounts of skin that's obliterated her lateral canthal angle completely, but with this extension plus the deep sutures and abicularis uh, debulking, uh, you can. Uh, reveal the lateral canthal angle and also a larger pretarsal platform. Now, brow ptosis. So this is not a lecture on brow ptosis, but I, I will just mention a couple of things. First of all, not every low brow requires elevation. Not every patient wants it. And a lot of patients have low brows, even in youth. So before you embark on brow lifting, just be sure that that is what the patient wants, and that is not different to what they were before. So here's a patient with low brow. She says, well, and high hairline. I want, I hate this hooding. What can you do? Can you make it better? So there's a trick. We can call it the Joshi Tuck. So 
If you use a cotton bud or a non-tooth forceps and you ask the patient to look down, pull the eyebrow up with your finger and then push the skin quite firmly backwards and inwards, then ask the patient to slowly look straight ahead and then release the brow, but take the instrument away laterally and slowly, you will reveal a pretarsal ligature. Then you can take a photograph before they blink and show them the difference and say, if you achieved this result with this low brow, would you be happy? And they show you a photograph and say, I was always like that. Then you can say, okay, we can just do a blepharoplasty with those things that I showed you, the vicular section and the high suture, and what will be the result? Well, here's the result postoperatively bilaterally. So she's happy. She has a lid show she never had, and she looks less hooded without changing the brow position. But if you want to correct the brow ptosis, how do you correct it? Again, there are, this is beyond this lecture, but all you need to think is, do I do this superperiosteally or subperiosteally? The young do well with subperiosteal, the older do well with supraperiosteal because the older have huge anterior lamellar slippage. The periosteum stays, but the skin and the muscle and all the tissues above the periosteum is very slippery. So no matter what you do subperiosteally in a very elderly patient, it's going to fall. The other thing is if it's subperiosteal, do you do endoscopic or not? Do you do a scalp entry or, and or a lid entry? If you do a supraperiosteal, do you do a direct, do you do a pre, do you do a post uh, hairline resection? But of course, if you think about it, unless you do uh, extensive endoscopic brow elevation in a young patient where you disperse the additional tissue over a large area, just attempting to do a subperiosteal elevation through, a, for example, an eyelid or, or is very difficult because where does the extra skin go? It, Sooner or later, it's going to fall because uh, you, you haven't removed that or you haven't uh, dissipated it. Of course, in an endobrow, you can dissipate it all through the scalp, but in a trans bleth subperiosteal elevation, I'm not sure that ever works. And I, if you don't remove skin uh, in this area, it, that technique will not work. But of course, Botox has an effect. And I say to patients uh, in some situations with a small degree of lateral brow toast, maybe. Botox would be adequate. Here's a bra patient who's had a blepharoplasty and a post-tracheal skin resection because she has a low brow and she has an effect uh, uh, is, uh, and has an effect on the brow position. Now, someone like this, an elderly, uh, you can only deliver the blepharoplasty with a brow left for symmetry, and it has to be a direct brow. So, lastly, lacrimal gland. You will see swelling in this area. So, if you see a lot of swelling beyond uh, in the lateral third, you must think, is this lacrimal gland prolapse? Now, the next question is, do I need to reposition the lacrimal gland prolapse? A huge number of patients, especially with functional dermatoclasis and secondary ptosis, uh, pseudotosis, will have a degree of lacrimal gland prolapse. You don't have to fix every lacrimal gland prolapse. And unless you're super confident about doing the surgery, you need just to explain to them, look, you've got a bit of puffiness here, so we're going to do a bit of septal thermoplasty, whatever, skin resection or vicularis removal, so it'll be a little bit softer, but it won't be completely gone because the realignment of lacrimal gland is actually quite complex. For those who don't do it often, I mean, if you do it, if you go in to post through the septum, it's relatively straightforward. The key is to find the lacrimal gland, to delineate the entire lacrimal gland, which I've dotted here, and also to find the orbital rim, to place sutures in the posterior lacrimal gland capsule. This is the technique that I use. And then the posterior orbital periosteum. And as you pull the stitch, which you can see here, it prolapses backwards. Now, I have also given you a video which you can get from uh, the website, which shows the technique of lacrimal gland repositioning, should you wish to do it. And so those who have a very obvious, as in this young lady, 
a lacrimal gland prolapse due to a condition called blepharochalasis, where they have re recurrent bouts of inflammation, which stretches and attenuates the skin and septum and allows the lacrimal gland to prolapse. There's no uh, choice but to reposition a lacrimal gland. But before you do that, just uh, I would say I have a number of patients who have very dry eyes as a consequence of lacrimal gland biopsies, manipulation, etc. So uh, just be careful if you're going to do this because not only can you damage the lacrimal gland, it really can bleed a lot, but you can also damage the ductules in that area by your incision without thinking you've damaged the lacrimal gland. So finally, the execution. So I'm going to show you a video which you also have a copy of, should you wish, and I will just take you through a routine upper blepharoplasty. Again, this is simply my technique. This is not the technique that you should undertake. If you have a good technique, stick to it. So I've drawn the uh, aesthetic marking. Here's the surgical marking going along the crease uh, and extending to the crow's feet superiorly. And then the upper incision. You'll see some dots above that, which is the, from the aesthetic marking. This is the surgical marking. I've made a slight mistake, which I've corrected. A contact lens, I always use a contact lens uh, because uh, it, it protects the eye. Uh, then I'm, I'm cutting with a Colorado. And the next question I'm often asked is, uh, why do you use a Colorado? Why not a blade? It really doesn't, it's a personal preference. You can use laser, you can use Colorados, you can use steel, you can use anything. But you know, this is just what I use. If you use a Colorado, you need to uh, give it two more days for healing uh, before you take the stitches out. Then I do the selective uh, anatomical blepharoplasty. So I'm taking out all the skin. Uh, so here, uh, if you hydrodissect the tissues just under the skin, then it's much easier to, to remove the skin uh, and leave the ubiquinaris completely intact. So hydrodissection with uh, 2.5 mils of uh, local anesthesia, uh, and there's a combination that I use. Uh, helps with this. Now, this is the lateral ubiquitaris, which I always take out the entire bit because there's a brow depressor, and I'm taking out about 40% of the superior. So this ubiquitaris is a brow depressor because it's a vertical fibers. And this is where we get the Botox uh, to raise the brow. So I always take out the entire bit of this. And the rest, depending on the volume that I want to adjust, I will take out up to a half of the superior ubiquitaris. If you have a volume depleted patient, then you could leave all the ubiquitaris but you can make a tiny incision to access the septum if you wish to put the sutures in. So here's the abiculitis removed, and that's the pattern of the resection. Then I'm taking out, just to show you, the, the bulge of the medial third, and this is often a combination of both the medial pole of the preapineuric fat pad, which is this yellow bulge here, which I freed up, and also the paler pre, uh, the medial fat pad. So here I'm gonna take both out, now, you, you, know, you can use this to suture once you've mobilized, if you've got a, a volume depletion, uh, but I'm just resecting it. Now, people say, I always use a clamp. I never use a clamp. Uh, the clamp causes this problem. Really, there are so many ways of doing this. It really doesn't matter. As long as you have a safe technique, I use the clamp. I'm old fashioned. I'm old. It doesn't matter. If you use a Colorado, that's fine too. As long as you know how much you want to remove. Here's a bit of septal thermoplasty, and I'm also putting it here to sort of define a platform. Now here is that stitch high up on the, uh, on the crease, abicularis and six ovicle here, and down on the abicularis, especially just above the lateral camptal angle. And that will give me that invagination of tissue that I showed you that Santiago uh, beautifully drawn out for me. And then it's skin, septum, skin, uh, proline stitches. And I use interrupted if I want to make a defined skin crease as I do in most blepharoplasty. And that's the end result. Now, I usually use Dermabond on top. Um, I use a Dermabond rather than a Steri-Strip because uh, it looks uh, uh, more natural and also people are able to go out. I have some patients who are desperate to put their makeup on. And if you put a light layer of Dermabond, then they can put the makeup on top. And then the, what you have to say to them is that every evening put some uh, ointment or cream on the Dermabond because otherwise it's very difficult to take out, out a week later when they come for their suture removal. So hopefully I have uh, shown you the four points that I said I would, the objective, the assessment, the why, and explained to you, and I've demonstrated the execution. Um, but what I, again, will say is that 
there are many, many ways of achieving the desired outcome. And the problems that I see often are because the patient's wishes and the surgeon's execution, there's a mismatch. And it isn't that, uh, you know, the, the surgeon is incompetent. It's just not delivering what the patient wanted in the first place. So make sure that this matches. And if this matches, you're onto a winner. You'll have a successful life in aesthetic surgery. So just, you know, as I get older, I get all philosophical. So I always give a bit of philosophy and that's a bit of philosophy about making sure your patients are happy and not always have one technique. And if someone else down the road is better than you at the, what the patient wants, be strong enough to send the patient to that, pay, for, to that surgeon or non-surgeon because all you want is happy patients because one unhappy patient will negate a thousand happy ones. So I never knew what a webinar was until COVID. So COVID has some of the advantages. So I'm this tiny agent, it seems to have really devastated our lives, uh, but I've learned to do webinar uh, lectures and I hope it was useful to you. So I'm just going to show you some fun pictures. So pre COVID-19, uh, we went out as a family a lot and we ate from uh, small portions and huge plates and very fancy restaurants. We dressed very elegantly and, and we spoke in a restrained way and our smiles were also restrained. You'll see my family, these pictures I always show, looking very elegant and there's me and my wife about to go to a rock and roll party. So we dressed up well before COVID-19. Now, of course, we don't go out anymore. So we stay at home. Uh, we cook much bigger, enormous plates of food and I put on uh, two kilograms despite my exercises. And some of you who've seen me before will probably notice the slight change in my facial features. But our outfits are much more casual. Here I am in my t-shirt. Uh, but our smiles are larger. And as uh, Memo mentioned, this is because uh, we've imbibed in a lot more bottles of booze at the same time. But for sure, this nasty thing will disappear. I've actually given up with COVID. I, I now try to live my life completely normally. I see who I want. Uh, I touch everyone. I might even give them a kiss. Uh, so I hope that when this is all over that you will visit London and if you ever wish to attend surgery, uh, we, we have surgical, I have surgical sessions on Monday and Tuesday mornings and you're very welcome. And I wish you, your family and your friends our very best wishes and, and I hope that all of you have not suffered too much with this disease. And thank you for uh, joining into this broadcast. Thank you very much. Naresh, thank you very much for that absolutely delicious presentation. It, it was fantastic. And just to uh, reassure you that the photographs and the videos, all of it came through very nicely. And I have to congratulate you because you even made the virus attractive with a fantastic photograph. It really was an outstanding uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Gerard, I think at this point you want to uh, do a poll, is that right? Before I take any questions. I will do, Memo, yeah. And, and thank you, I, I echo what Memo just said, Naresh. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. Really, 